It's easy to get into home roasting though, right? Because you can do that on anything. I mean, you can really do it with a frying pan. It is an immensely labor-intensive process to grow coffee. So we started this three years and two days ago. This is the seed of a cherry. Mycotoxins are toxins that are produced by yeast and fungi. So I, I leased this roaster from higher grounds, really dialing in a roast and really being able to execute it the way I want it. You don't want to do this really fast. Because most of the coffee in the rest of the world is all bred from a, a tiny handful of beans. My name is Luke Cizek. I'm the founder and roaster at Lab Notes Coffee. So coffee originated in Ethiopia. It's since been spread you know, throughout the whole world. But originally a lot of European countries, I want to say like the Dutch and the French, really started like exporting coffee out of Ethiopia into Europe. But they really wanted to maintain their monopoly and not let other people grow coffee. So there were export rules saying all the beans had to be boiled before they left the country so that nobody could actually use the, plant these seeds and, and grow their own coffee. Most of the coffee that's available in countries outside of Africa are all descendants from literally one handful of coffee that a Dutch person smuggled out in the 1500s. I believe it was 1500, somewhere around there. And at the time, you know, doing so, I, th I believe the penalty was death. Like, you could get killed for smuggling out unboiled coffee. It is an immensely labor-intensive process to grow coffee. All right, the cherries, generally speaking, are picked by hand when ripe. Every cherry has two coffee beans in it. So think about how many coffee beans go into your one cup of coffee that you drink in the morning. So, so much work goes into growing that plant, picking all of the cherries, then processing the cherries, and ending with a green coffee that someone can roast. And I think just general awareness about that is important. People need to realize that, that the people growing the coffee are the ones really doing all the work. You know, think about anything else you buy and how much, how big it is and how much it costs you. To be able to get a, a pound of green coffee for under two dollars, that's wild. This is the seed of a cherry. So there's a whole process for getting the beans out of the cherry. There's naturally processed, which historically has been my, my favorite. You're less likely to have bad things happen, like the coffee end up with a bunch of mycotoxins. So mycotoxins are toxins that are produced by yeast and fungi. Some of the like stated effects of those include things like jitteriness, stuff that people actually attribute to, to caffeine. Um, and these are things that are are going to be more prominent in those cheaper coffees, right? Where the, they really are not processed well in terms of what happens after harvesting. They're not good for your body. They don't make you feel good. They don't add to your coffee drinking experience. It's the type of coffee where you drink a lot of it and it makes you feel kind of tired and you wonder what's wrong with this coffee. And then like six hours later, you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm awake and like I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Guess there was caffeine in there after all. But, but the way you feel right out of the gate is, uh, I, I, I believe, a good indicator of whether or not mycotoxins are present. I think, I sort of feel like coffee right now is going through what beer did, you know, a, a, few, a decade or a few decades ago. I feel like there's always more room. Granted, the, the roasters seem to be getting smaller and smaller. Um, but I think that's really awesome. So there's, you know, a handful of local roasters. I love to drink all their coffees. Um, and I'm really glad they all exist. I think it's a lot of fun to, to try other people's coffees. So from my point of view, there is a lot of room. I guess if your goal is world domination, you know, there's, there's already a lot of really big coffee companies out there. So you got to really bring something unique if you're going to take over. But it's neat that 
the coffee roasting world is slowly becoming more and more collaborative. Whereas before it was all super secretive, people didn't want to talk about how they roasted or share roast profiles or really get into the details of you know, their personal beliefs on roasting theory. Um, it was all like a hidden black box of this is our, our proprietary thing and we're not going to tell anybody about it. Um, so I think it's really cool that, you know, that people are talking about it more openly. I think even if you're doing something that works really well, it, it's why not share that with other people and let them try to do that too, really elevate you know, all of the coffee if you really think what you're doing is, is the best way to do it. So I have a full-time job that I do normally, and that's really what pays our bills. Um, we do this because we love doing it. So we started this three years and two days ago was our, <laughs> our launch date. So we've done this in a really like low capital expenditure way, right? We, we lease time on somebody else's roaster. We've actually been able to keep our expenses low enough that we can keep our purchases on zero interest introductory APR credit cards and pay them off and open a new one as needed. And so far, that has worked 100% for us. And, I, and I, we know that won't work forever and that at some point we'll actually take out a business loan. But it's been really, really helpful for kind of getting our foot in the door. So I was a patron here for years before I ever even thought of starting a coffee company or uh, trying to see if I could lease time on this particular roaster. So roasters are really, really expensive relative to what they make. So there's a small roaster. I roast five pounds at a time on it. A, a used roaster like this is like $15,000. Margins in coffee are pretty small, so it would really take a long time to pay that off. Um, and it also requires a, a commercial space to operate it in. So having no roaster or space for the roaster, leasing really worked out well. Initially, we thought maybe at some point we'd buy a roaster and operate it out of our house. The more I learn about all of this, the less likely I think that actually is, that we'll be able to get the right permitting for a bigger roaster on a residence. It's easy to get into home roasting though, right? Because you can do that on anything. I mean, you can really do it with a frying pan. You can get a $30 popcorn popper and, you, and use that. The home roaster I used for my sample roasting was about $400. So again, it's as a hobby, it's very, it's something you can really get into pretty easily. This computer makes its own graph, but there's no way that I'm aware of at least to get the data out of this graph. So every 30 seconds, I record the temperature, rate of change, total amount of time, and then lastly, the final temperature all play a role. So this orange line is the temperature change over time. Blue line is the actual temperature of the beans. Getting there in 11 versus 15 minutes will affect the roast. So I just entered the temperatures and it outputs a rate of rise in degrees per minute. The amount of time you spend in the last 10 degrees will dramatically affect the roast. And this is the type of curve that we're shooting for, where it peaks relatively early and then we have a continuous decline after that point. A different ending temperature of one degree, like we, we can, you can taste that. It would be so much harder to do stuff consistently if I wasn't taking the time to do it on this computer. Over roasting is much more common in terms of the whole world of coffee. There's a lot of coffee companies whose lightest coffee is darker than our darkest coffee. If that's the cup of coffee you like, that's th I have no problem with that. But for me, that I now see those as really not showing the true flavor of the coffee and really just having like a lot of roasty 
or, or ashy flavors. And a lot of people are kind of brought into coffee thinking that's what it's supposed to be, you know, like, like in a, a sensory class at a culinary school, they will teach you bitter with coffee. Like coffee is your example for bitter. But it's amazing. I mean, there is really just about any fruit and berry you can imagine. And there's a lot of chocolatey flavors. There can be buttery and caramely flavors. There can be earthy flavors. There can be different types of spiced flavors in there. It, you can detect as a nuance flavor in a brewed coffee that is literally just coffee. So we're gonna brew some coffee in a French press. First step is grinding it at the right size. This is just the regular Capresso coffee grinder that you can buy for your house. Um, I like to use the, court, the finest of the coarse grind sizes. Generally speaking, for French press and cold brew, you want to go with a coarse grind. For any new coffee I brew, I always start with a water to coffee ratio of 16 to 1 by weight. I always weigh everything. If you can weigh everything, you will be able to make the most consistent cup of coffee. So for a normal French press, just any French press you would buy at a store, you can generally brew 880 grams of water, which is just a little bit less than a liter. Uh, for that, I'll use five, or 55 grams of coffee. I always like to use water that's 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Some people like to go up to 205 or as low as 195. I feel like 200 is, is the perfect starting temperature to use. So I target a total brew time in a French press of five minutes. When I'm adding the water this way through a relatively slow pour kettle, um, that means I'll set a timer once I'm done adding the water for four minutes. If I was using a different kettle that adds the water all at once real quick, I would set the timer for five minutes. And usually about halfway through, I'll stop and just kind of swirl the coffee, make sure all the grounds are saturated. And now set a timer for four minutes. All right. Time to press the coffee. You don't want to do this really fast. That extra pressure will extract more out of the coffee, generally in a bad way. I would encourage everybody to pursue their passion. What is, what is it that's easier to do besides what you're interested in, right? So, so if there's something you're interested in, like, yeah, you should look into how you can work that into your life. And there's usually a way to do it regardless of your situation, right? And to use our coffee situation as the example, you know, not having to buy a coffee shop or buy a roaster in order to even start a company. And it, and it didn't start at starting a company, you know, it started at, I just would like to roast more coffee and doing a lot of roasting at home. Anybody who, I guess, feels like they can't pursue those things that they, they really want to do, I would challenge them to, to look at it differently and find a way. So I think, I think there's always a way to be able to make it happen. So we're going to make a pour over in a Chemex. While the coffee is grinding, you can wet out your filter. That way you don't have any dry spots where water will not flow through and extract through the coffee properly. And the first step is to do a uh, bloom with the coffee, do an initial wetting out of the grounds, and let everything become saturated in water. Uh, general rule of thumb is to use three times the mass of water as the mass of beans you have, so it's three times the weight of that 40 grams of coffee. The bloom will actually give you a sweeter coffee, it'll give you a better extraction. So what's happening now is all the grounds are becoming saturated with that initial water, and there's some initial like off-gassing that is happening from the beans. Now the idea for this is to pour near the center. You don't want to pour around the outer edge. Uh, pouring around the outer edge will cause the water to kind of bypass your grounds and just go straight into the bottom of the vessel. You don't want to fill it up all the way. Simultaneously, you don't want to let it dry out entirely. So I'll continue to add water in little pulses like this till we get to 640 grams. Really dialing in a roast and really being able to execute it the way I want it, right? So there's just that like personal satisfaction there with it going the way I want. But then feedback from people is a huge piece too. Like the, making something that other people enjoy is, I like a lot more than I would have guessed. Um, that, that really does bring me a lot of joy. Just being able to do something that I love and for it to also be something someone else really loves. 
is is my favorite part of it.